This program is brought to you in part by the Paul B. Hunter and Constance D. Hunter Charitable Foundation, Incorporated, a proud partner of WUCF-TV and the Central Florida community. Welcome to A Journey Through History. This is Central Florida Road Trip. Welcome to this episode of Central Florida Road Trip. I'm your host, Dr. Phil Hoffman. Today, we're going to be in Sumter County, and we're gonna be centered for our home base right here at Dade Battlefield Historic State Park, the site of the beginning of the Second Seminole War. Sumter County was created in 1853. It was named for General Thomas Sumter, a general in the American Revolutionary War. Now, years ago, the county was nicknamed Hog County, most likely because it's home to a large population of wild hogs. Back before Sumter County was even formed, the Dade Battlefield was a major part in writing the area's history. The Dade Battle of 1835 was the longest and most costly Indian War in American history. And we're really excited to be here with Bill Gruber, who is the manager here at the Dade Battlefield Historic State Park. Thank you so much, Bill, for making time for us today. It's a pleasure. So tell us a little bit about this park and what the history is behind it. This is the site of the battle that started the Second Seminole War. Uh, the longest, most costly Indian War in American history. You talk about uh, Seminoles, Florida Seminoles to most people and they think about football, but actually um, the longest and most costly Indian War in, in our whole country's history started right here, right in Florida, right where we're standing. We keep those, those memories live, commemorate that event from the soldier's perspective and from the Seminoles' perspective. And you know, when you speak of events, you also have an event every winter where you have a reenactment of this. That's our signature event. It's the annual reenactment of Dade's Battle of 1835. It's the first full weekend in January every year. And we have soldier and Seminole camps. We have period vendors that people can visit. And of course, the reenactment of the battle, which is um, a pretty full scale battle. It's not quite as many uh, people as were in the actual battle, but it's a significant number of reenactors, Seminole and soldier reenactors, and they reenact the actual events that occurred here in the sequence that they happened. We have a soldier narrator and a Seminole narrator to kind of keep, keep people informed so of what's both, going both on. Both so, point of views. Yes, right, yeah. and it's, uh, it's, it's well, well attended. We get several thousand people here every year for that. That's our biggest event, but we have other events throughout the year. Everything from a, a fanciful Halloween event to um, a World War II commemorative weekend in March because this, this park actually was the site of a World War II training base for a brief period during, during the war. Why is it so important for us to, to really preserve and talk about the history here at the Dade Battlefield? What happened here uh, and, and what followed it, seven years of warfare, uh, had, had a significant impact on Florida history and a significant impact on American history. And it was one of the first conflicts related to slavery. Before there was ever a, an Underground Railroad going north, there was one going south to Florida. A lot of the slaves came here and a lot of them joined with the Seminoles. And uh, of course, that was a source conflict. Now, I suppose uh, you've been here for a while and you've had a chance to give people tours and talk with people. What's, what's the observation you hear most frequently from people? What are they surprised about or something they didn't know once they visit here? Well, you know, at the time of this battle, everyone in, everyone in America knew about it. It was an earth-shaking event. It was big national news. Most people that come here never heard of this battle, never heard of the Second Seminole War. So whenever they come here, it's a real voyage of discovery. They come here and learn about a part of American history that they never even knew existed, much less that when, when, when people picture the Indian Wars, they picture the Western Indian Wars because that's what we see in the movies and that make, you know, Indians uh, galloping across the plains with flowing headdresses is, is more cinematic than uh, creeping through the palmettos down here. What's interesting about this battle is that, you know, the soldiers didn't want to be here. This was, it wasn't the choice post. When you got to West Point, you didn't ask to go to Florida. Mm -hmm. And the Seminoles just wanted to be left alone. They were just fighting for their homes. So there's a lot of drama and there's a lot of a passion on both sides. And, and like I said, it's, it's a journey of discovery because most people just don't know about this history. It's, there's been so much more American history, so much more histor historical water under the bridge since 1835 that, um, People just have, have kind of forgotten this story. Two months after this battle was the Siege of the Alamo, a much better story to mythologize and, and turn into a hero story than this one was. 
So it's largely been forgotten, but it was very significant in the development of Florida and the United States. Well, Bill, thank you for your time today. We appreciate you welcoming us out here. Okay. And we're glad to learn more about Dade Battlefield. Dade and his men actually were traveling this path right behind me as they made their way from here to Fort King. And that's why this is Dade Battlefield. This defines Sumter County's past, but it's really the villages that define Sumter County's present and future. In the 1970s, the villages started out as a mobile home community, Orange Blossom Gardens. But with the success of other retirement communities, the focus shifted a little bit in the mid 80s. And as they say, the rest is history. For the past two years, the Villages has been the top selling master plan community in the entire United States, adding more than 3000 homes over the past two years. Portions of the Villages are also stretching into Lake and Marion counties. As a retirement community, the Villages is home to a large number of veterans, and it was that group, their family and friends who all came together around a project dear to their hearts. They're planning to build an education center up in uh, Washington, D.C., between the Lincoln Memorial and the Vietnam Memorial Wall. And they're going to have an interactive screen with all these pictures on so that they're going to be memorialized for, for a, a long time to come. And, and future generations will see the sacrifices that they made. They got with our president, uh, Pete Wagner, and said, why don't we spearhead the effort to find these pictures of the Florida veterans. Uh, there's 30 Vietnam veterans chapters in Florida, and we have what's called a Florida State Council, which is the focal group for all these chapters. So I said, let's go to the uh, Florida State Council and, and ask them to get all our other chapters to help find these photos. And that's sort of how the effort started. I love doing genealogy, and I knew from the articles in the paper that it was some Vietnam veterans that were working on it. And I called them and I said, do you have any genealogists working on it? Because we think differently when we're trying to find lost family members. They said, no, welcome aboard. You keep reaching out to people, the libraries and genealogists, families, to try to keep working on it. And it'll break loose and then you'll get several, several more. Filling in that missing piece when you see their faces that was my generation, and I forgot how young they all were until you see them. I presume they're like me, they're the same age as me, but they're not. And it's very emotional. Every time I do find a photo, I, I'm very, always very emotional about it. This is Beth. Hello? Uh, I think so. I got a beep and I hadn't grabbed it yet, so that's the picture coming over. There he is, Michael Gary Dinkins, just came over. It's, it's just unfinished until all of them are done. I, I feel good that we found the other person, but that just tells me that we've got more work to do, though. It has to be. We've got to get it done. This veteran group's mission is not only to honor the fallen, but to ensure they're never forgotten. That military connection is also honored a little further south in Sumter County in Bushnell at the Florida National Cemetery. Florida National Cemetery is the second busiest national cemetery in the United States. We do roughly 7,000 interments annually. We're over 600 acres. We opened up in 1988 and we currently have 166,000 veterans and their dependents interred here in the cemetery and a lot of families don't even realize what maybe their loved one's service meant until they come to the cemetery, they go to a service where they receive full military honors, they see the headstones, they see the care that is taken by the staff, and then that really drives home the sacrifice and the honorable service that their, their loved one performed.
Now let's see what our favorite history devotee, Don Price, has uncovered for this week's Artifact. Thanks, Phil. I'm here at the Orange County Regional History Center with Chief Curator Pamela Swartz. And I know that, you know, we're in Orange County, and this photo here is from Sumter. Mm -hmm. But tell us a little bit about it. I know it's out of your range, but tell us a little bit about this photo. This photo, we believe, is actually taken in Orlando, uh, but we're talking about how it relates to Sumter County. And uh, if you look at the, the front of this photo, um, it actually says Orlando, Mount Dora, Eustis, and Wildwood. So it takes us up that far. And what the photo is, is circa around probably 1927. It can't right. be before that. Um, but this is a picture of what they refer to as a parlor bus. Mm. Um, so around this time period, they thought Wildwood was going to really become a booming area um, in Florida. And I don't know that we, we've ever gotten there. Um, but the Seaboard Airline Railway was coming through and going in a bunch of different directions. It was creating jobs. It was it had the ability to not only bring people to Wildwood, but to take them out. And so in the case of this photo, people could board one of these buses um, and go to the Orange Blossom Special and actually be taken as far as New York or Montreal. Um, but in this case, it also came back and forth between Orlando and these other communities. So it's really interesting that people could, could just just like you would an Uber today, right? This Correct. is a mega, this is an Uber black, right? Of right. 1927, it's huge. Like I said, they called them a parlor bus. Um, but an, an interesting fact about this too uh, is the next year in 1928, uh, we found a newspaper article about how they extended the hours to 9.30 p.m. And that was uh, a big deal because people could come from all of these other communities and stay in Orlando and shop longer and even catch a flick uh, at the theater before they got back on to go home. Um, wow. So it's one of those funny things where we kind of laugh at some of the things you read in newspapers today. Mm -hmm. um, but it was it was a big deal to be able to not have to drive down this far, um, figure out parking and all of that. Um, and another interesting thing about this artifact is that we actually have a letter. We received this from a woman um, in Texas. Wow. She sent it to us. And it turns out that the individuals getting in the parlor bus are her great grandparents and her grandmother. Wow! Um, and they uh, didn't live here, is my understanding. Um, she did grow up in the Miami area. But it's an interesting story about how these artifacts come to find us. It was mailed to us from uh, Texas, and probably just because it said Orlando across mm -hmm. the front of that bus. If it didn't, they would have probably never known it was here. Correct. Well, thank you. Yeah, Thanks, Pam. Another gem from the Regional History Center. Thanks for sharing. Here's a Central Florida road trip fast fact for you statistic junkies. Sumter County has the oldest median age of any U.S. county at 62.7 years. Fortunately, you're only as old as you feel, Sumter County. Among the more famous faces here in Sumter County is Walter Ray Williams, a two-sport professional athlete. And those two sports, well, I guess you could say they go hand in hand. Walter Ray Williams Jr. is one of the biggest names in professional bowling. He currently holds the record with 47 all-time PBA tour titles and is also the PBA record holder for career earnings. He's a seven-time PBA Player of the Year and has won at least one PBA tour title in 17 consecutive seasons. Both of these feats are PBA records. But before bowling, he was a champion of another sport. Yes, horseshoe pitching. Well, I first started playing horseshoes when I was about nine. I really can't even explain why, but before my dad taught me how, that's what I wanted to do is play horseshoes. When he finally taught me how, I went out and practiced and practiced and practiced and practiced and practiced and practiced and practiced. And, practiced. and within a year, I finished second at the uh, Junior World Championships. That's where I got my nickname Deadeye in the qualifying rounds. I had 45 ringers out of 50 shoes. So I used to be pretty good way back then. I ended up winning the junior championships three times. I won one as 11. I was also the youngest at that time to win it and also broke the record for high average, averaging 86% ringers that year. The next year I broke the record again, averaging 89%. I ended up winning the men's championship six times total. When I was young, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a professional horseshoe player, but I also knew that there wasn't much money in it, but I enjoyed the game and loved to compete. I do actually kind of like horseshoes, a little over bowling, uh, but bowling's how I make my living, and I really enjoy bowling, but my first love was horseshoes.
Well, I got introduced to bowling when I was about 11. I didn't bowl a lot until I was about 19. That's when I really got into bowling, bowling about 15, 20 games a week. And the more I bowled, the better I got. The better I got, the more I bowled. And all of a sudden, I'm averaging 200. And I'm still going to college at that time. Ended up uh, getting a degree in physics, minor in mathematics, and went on tour when I was 23 full time. And fortunately, it worked out very well. Definitely being a horseshoe player helped me become a better bowler because I didn't grow up in a bowling center. A lot of these guys that bowl on tour bowled 50, 100 games a week, and I probably bowled 10, 15, 20 games a week when I first started out. The horseshoe swing, being accurate, carried over to bowling where I was able to improve a little bit faster without as much bowling. And once I started getting really good, I started bowling tournaments, and that kind of got me even better faster. Perfect ball. I've been fooling around with the two-handed method, which basically it's a lot of power, and I think that's a big attraction. It's an easier way for me to learn to get the hook on the ball. The difference is, is it takes a lot of control. It's not the best way for me to throw the ball, but sometimes it's very effective. When I first started bowling on tour, I didn't have the expectations of being one of the best ever. And I don't really consider myself the best ever. I do have the most titles, but I've also had a long career. 25 years that I won all of my 47 titles, which is, which is significant. And I think that's the other part of it. I was player of the year when I was 26. I was also player of the year when I was 50. So that's another thing, being bowler of the decade, you know, back-to-back -back decades. I don't know that anybody else will ever do that because that's a very challenging thing to do, to be that good for that long. But I had a lot of really good years. Very fortunate to do something I enjoy, make a good living at it. I definitely enjoy the competition. I think that's one thing that helped motivate me that I enjoyed competition, enjoy bowling, and look forward to competing. What drives somebody to be super good, you know, is also kind of what keeps them doing that. Definitely turned out very well. I cannot complain about what's, about, about what's happened with me in my life, and everybody should be so lucky to do something they enjoy doing. At age 59, Walter continues to compete in both horseshoes and bowling. And in fact, he makes the villages his home base for most of his practice. And if you live in the villages, let's face it, one thing you really have to have is a cool golf cart. Here in the villages, there's about 55,000 golf carts, over 100 miles of golf cart paths. So it's, it's a, a, a way of transportation and just fun. Like us, we had two cars when we moved here. We got rid of one car and uh, bought two golf carts. And that's all we drive. Our car sits in the garage for weeks at a time. And it's, the golf carts are the first thing to come out of the garage. Each cart is uh, unique in its own way, but some of them are an expression of their own personalities. Al Capone here. Hey, shoot it, man. Hey, man, how are you? Good to see you in the villages, baby. I was born and raised in New York. Went to every game I could at the stadium. And the only reason why, one of the reasons why I moved to the villages is now I can go to spring training so I didn't get rid of my Yankees. The court says that you can take a girl out of New York, but you can't take New York out of the girl. I seen it and I said, I gotta have it. It's a 35 Chevy, because I was born 35. And then that Laurel and Hardy on the back, I got that from a friend of mine who was going through a bad divorce and she was busting everything in the house. And he says, take that, and I did. That was about 50 years ago. <laughs> I'm a retired firefighter. I did 31 years in a county department east of San Francisco. And like it says on the front, my retired engine was engine 87. I was sitting in the garage drinking back when I used to drink, and I've had it since 04, and it's got about 34,000 miles on it. So I've been putting miles. This is all I drive. It's got a lot of power because it's got a small V8 under the hood. The street rods are unique in their own way. They are all custom, and uh, they're the most unique carts in the world. We have over 420 of these running around. Do not have two identical. Everybody kind of makes them their own, and uh, it's, it's just a blast.
Now those are some fine rides. But you know, a lot of Sumter County is actually more rural, so maybe a tractor is more appropriate, right? Well, of course, Sumter County then is home to the Tractor Museum. Farming and tractors have been around for generations. Both have played a big part in our nation's history. And there have been many different manufacturers through the years, but Leesburg Stuart Paquette thinks one stands above them all. International Harvester. So much so, in fact, he had to start his own museum. Who wants to look at tractors? I said that to myself. I had never been on a tractor. I'd never been on a farm. I didn't know anything about farming. I didn't know anything about the tractors. Nothing, I never had one. I was very impressed with the farmers because they know the tractors, they live that life, and I, I just have the greatest respect for all the, the farming community. Everybody asks me, how many tractors do you have? I'm not really sure, but I think 250. Well, it doesn't stamp international on it. It's not here. We don't want it here. All the signage here is all authentic, farm all, it's all international. We've got all the gold tractors. They made gold tractors in 1970, and they made five different models, and we have all of them. Two of the five, they only made one of each of these, and we've got both of them. We tried to get something of everything they made. So they made dehumidifiers. They made air conditioners. They made refrigerators. They made rifles. They made 330-something thousand rifles from 1942 to 1954. And we've chased this stuff down. This flag behind us here, that flag came from the, the, from the Fort Wayne plant, Fort Wayne, Indiana. And that's the last day the plant was open. So that's the last flag to fly over that Fort Wayne plant. And of all the tractors in the world, does Stewart have a favorite? The 1206, that was the biggest one. That tractor was the first over 100 horsepower to hit the field. It's a pretty unique tractor because it has white wheels and it has a white grill and it has a white air breather and all that. And that's the one I like the best. That's my favorite. I think it's just like collecting old, old cars. Same thing. Same as old collecting anything. We get a variety of people. It's amazing. We get people all over the world. South America, we have Russia, France, Germany, Spain, and I've had people time and time again just cry that they didn't believe there was any of this was left. You know, they've been scrapping these tractors 1,500 a day, and we've been trying to save our little piece of it here. But International is gone. I mean, they, they're not gonna make any more of these tractors, and the thing is, is to have everybody come and see this. I mean, it's, it's not something you can do anywhere else. In the south of Sumter County is the Green Swamp, which holds the headwaters to four South Florida rivers. The North Edge sits on the edge of the Ocala National Forest, where a 96-year-old man is on a special mission. Lee Swallows and two of his friends are making the mile-and-a-half trek through the Ocala National Forest. This mile-and-a-half journey, however, is not just for exercise, but rather it's the only way to reach their destination. I've always had an interest in the Ocala Forest, and I've walked the entire length of the forest on the scenic trail. During one of those walks, Lee accidentally came upon an unusual site, the Long Family Cemetery, an old family plot of some 10 graves that is literally in the middle of nowhere. The Longs came in early 1800s and settled in, in this area. The cemetery was in not very good condition. Some of the pickets were off and the gate had sagged and it, it, it was just bedraggled. It, it needed some attention. So Lee was just the man for the job. He went to the Division of Forestry and signed up as a volunteer to help bring some life back to this cemetery. So Lee walked into the office, this amazing guy, lots of energy in his 90s. And he's so gung-ho about the Long Cemetery. And because of budget cuts and whatnot, it's in disarray. It's, it needs some love. And I told him, I said, you're going to be the friends of the Yearling Trail now. So he came in here totally off the grid on his own and decided that he wanted to make a difference and volunteer. You got it. That's just right. It's a kind of an ongoing process. 
if you if you really love it, that's not much of an effort because you're 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 where you want to be. When you get here and look around at at the trees, the forest here, it just it just gets in your blood, and I just I love it. So that's the reason I come. You're, it's quiet. I just can't help myself. I love it. A guy like Lee, he gives us hope that you hear all the bad stuff in the news and there's good people out there willing to still do some good stuff on their own dime, you know, their own time. And at his age, that's amazing. I, I pray and hope that I'm in that same situation and able to give back and still healthy enough to do the stuff that he's willing to do for us. That can't help but uh, make you make you feel good, make you, make you satisfied with your day and uh, with, with your time and, and, and what you've done. Make the world a little better. <laughs> Did you know the Lake Eola Fountain in Orlando was first installed in 1912? Or why thousands of people flocked to this particular post office at Christmas time? That and so much more next week on Central Florida Road Trip. Think you might know a bit of history that we've missed? Then head on over to Facebook.com slash WUCF-TV and let us know. And for more adventures around our area, check out other episodes of Central Florida Road Trip at WUCF.org slash road trip. That's it for this episode of Central Florida Road Trip. Thanks for joining us as we took a tour around Sumter County. And make sure you tune in next time as we continue to explore the rich history that surrounds us all every day right here in Central Florida. This program is brought to you in part by the Paul B. Hunter and Constance D. Hunter Charitable Foundation, Incorporated a proud partner of WUCF-TV and the Central Florida community.